We welcome all of you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. As we are, we are assembled to honor our Lord <clears throat> and benefit one another. We welcome those who join us on live stream. We do appreciate you taking the time to be with us. This will be the 23rd message in the second coming of Christ. Tonight, he will come in glory. <clears throat> Now there are there are a few subjects as weighty as that of the second coming of Christ. It's a very weighty subject. And yet there are a few subjects that have been so distorted by men as this one. It seems to me as though Satan is focused on clouding this thing up. There's other things he does the same thing, but this particularly this one, this is this is this is the ultimate reason why we take the Lord's Supper yeah, till he come. Right. The coming of the Lord as regards the earth is consistently associated with conclusions. Not with the commencement of things on earth, with the conclusion of things on earth. Peter reminds us it's the end of the world. Yeah. The heavens will pass. When Jesus comes, says the heavens will pass away with the great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works therein will be burned up. That's when Jesus comes. That's going to happen. Jesus came once to minister on the earth. He will never do so again. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And the, uh, the the flesh and death is going to, are going to be obviated at, when Jesus comes. The resurrection of the dead. At the last trump, at the last trump, the dead are going to be raised. Amen. And death shall lose its power. We will stand, O oh, death, where is thy sting? And O oh, grave, where is thy victory? As it's connected with the coming of Christ. And there'll be a harvest of both the saved and the lost. Jesus said the lost will be taken first. Boy, that contradicts a lot of theology. That's what he said. The tares will be gathered out first. Why? Because they're the misfits, not us. And then the things will be gathered. Angels are going to do it. They're going to gather them all. Tares first. Gather out all things that offend. It's speaking about people. Pair personalities. It's going to happen when Jesus comes again. And it's going to be the conclusion of salvation as being worked out in a temporal zone, so to speak. Peter speaks about the salvation that's ready to be revealed. That's the full, full scope of it at that time. So you do want to have you, your experience of salvation now, you want it to be able to blend in with the coming of Christ. <laughs> See, there is an approach to salvation that will be obsolete when it won't, won't fit in. But that, of course, is why Jesus is ministering now, to ensure that this, that this happens. And it's going to be the end of the wicked one, too. <laughs> Satan's not going to be able to survive the coming of the Lord. He's always been inferior to Christ. Even when Jesus was on earth, Satan was inferior to him. The demons inferior to him. Satan never argued with Jesus. The Pharisees did, but there, Satan never did. Demons never did. Satan never attacked Jesus. Demons never attacked Jesus. Men did, but tried to, but they couldn't. So when Jesus comes, the, the devil is going to destroy the devil once and for all. That is, destroying the scripture does not mean annihilate. I dedicate this to the soul sleepers. It doesn't mean annihilate. It means there's no further purpose are served by them. It's the opposite of sanctify. Destruct, destruction is the opposite of sanctification. So Satan will have no further utility. He will not be able to do anything he wants to do. <laughs> and all those that 
he deluded, they'll not be able to do anything they want to do. But that's going to happen when Jesus comes again. Now we want to deal with the matter of Jesus coming in glory. Our text said when the when see whenever you read the word when that means this is something you ought to you want to expect. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And not some of the angels, and all the holy angels with him. Then he'll sit upon the throne of David. Uh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> He'll sit upon the throne of his glory. Yeah, amen. I mean, this is, what he, this is what the Son of Man said, mm -hmm. Son of God said. Now let's look at this word, what, that, what this glory, what this involves. There's, there's two kinds of glory. There's glory we give to God. That's one kind of glory. And the scriptures speak about it. Give glory to God, Jeremiah said. See, that's, that's one kind of glory. Jesus wants to heal ten lepers, you know, and only one came back. I, I've often wondered if that isn't like an accurate percentage, one-tenth. Yeah. I have an idea that that's closer to an average who returned to give thanks. Anyway, one one time, he said... Uh, there's not found that return to give glory to God, save the strangers, the Gentile. See, that, you know, that's one kind of glory, giving glory to God. Unto him be glory in the church. That's revolutionary, isn't it? Some people go to church to have fun. Very enjoyable. Glory be to him in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages. And there's a loud voice John heard in heaven saying, Fear God and give glory to him. All right, that's one kind of glory, giving glory to God. Now, that's not the kind of glory we're talking about here. When it comes to Jesus Christ, glory is what we might say inherent in Christ. It's, it's actually a part of him. Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus that when he first met him, they didn't know who he was and they were cast down, you remember? That we thought he was the one. We, we thought that Jesus of Nazareth, we thought he was, we, we thought he was the one. Almost that it sounded to the king of glory. We, th we thought he was the one. He said, oh, fools. Yeah. <laughs> fools. Fools are slow a heart to believe. He said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Amen. It's his glory. It's not a glory. It's his glory. Amen. In fact, Paul, he's very precise in referring to this. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. It's a glory that will be conferred upon us, but it is inherent or a part of yes. Christ's makeup. <clears throat> this has to do with the glory he obtained when he was glorified in heaven, the right hand of God. The glory of God, uh, Acts 3.13, says he has, God has glorified Christ. I want to take a moment here to, to attempt to define a little further what glory is. The glory of a thing is what can be seen of it. Yeah, right. What is made known of it, can be perceived of it, is its glory. So the scriptures speak about the the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, and the glory of the stars. What is that? That's what you see of it. When Jesus was glorified in his uh, transfiguration, what he really was came out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So the glory of a thing is when you can see it and how much of it you can see it. Amen. If you see a lot of Christ, you've seen a lot of glory. Now, God 
Jesus is like God in this respect. He has inherent glory. There's so much glory in God that he had to, he, he walked past Moses who was hidden in a cleft of a rock. And after he'd passed his glory, you could still see the evidence of him being there. And Moses got to see that. Or he, could, he couldn't see the whole thing, otherwise he'd die. It's what could be seen. It took the form of fire and this sort of thing. But it could be seen. It could be perceived. So if, if you have glory and your, glo and your glory, if people can see what you are, that's your glory, what they see. So what's, the glory of Christ has to do with what, he, with what he is. God said to Moses, you can't see my face and live. There's, I mean, there's two, if you see me, the fullness of who I am, you, you can't survive. I'm eternal, you're temporal. And what's eternal swallows up what's temporal. That's the way it is. The resurrection of the dead, there won't be any more old body. <laughs> It'll be, be swallowed up in victory. See? Glory. Now, the post-resurrection appearances of Christ upon earth, he, he veiled his glory. He was... He, was in this, he enabled them to see him by some miraculous means. They'd have never been able to see Jesus after he rose from the dead if he didn't condescend to accommodate himself to human perception. Mark says in Mark 16, 12, when he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, says he appeared to them in another form. See, <laughs> they had to have a earthly form where they couldn't ever have... You can't see a spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. And you can't see a glorified body either. Mm -hmm. it's a, in its fullness, it's, it's veiled. He even looked like a gardener to Mary. Yeah. He looked like a gardener. How could, the, how could the Son of God look like a gardener? Well, he, he accommodated himself. She'd have died of fright. Yeah. Yeah. She, couldn't have, she couldn't afford to see it. Remember that time he appeared to the disciples? He just suddenly, there he was. Someone said, well, he had that body could go through walls. <laughs> They're missing the point. The miracle wasn't that he went through the wall. The miracle was that they saw. He just, he accommodated them. He wanted them to see that he was alive. So he just suddenly appeared. There he was. So I'm point, making a point. He veiled his glory. Otherwise, could you imagine all of his resplendent glory if he'd have pop turned up there like he did when he rose from the dead and the watchmen there fell like dead men? <laughs> they just saw a little bit of the glory. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he, there were some special appearances he made they were accommodating human frailty. Yeah. Uh -huh. Chosen beforehand, he, P Peter told Cornelius, now Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he appeared to witnesses chosen beforehand. He, the first one he appeared to is Mary Magdalene, which violates legalistic protocol. Uh -huh. yeah, right. yeah. Appeared to a woman first, yeah, that's what he did. That's what he did, brother. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to Mary Magdalene first. Yeah. Just so you know that in Christ, women aren't denigrated. Not in Christ. Yeah. Amen. And he appeared to the disciples on the seashore. You remember that? Uh -huh. yeah. And they didn't see like a bright light over there. Yeah. They saw a man standing over there. Yeah. And they could tell because it's tremendous catch of fish they got. Yeah. John said, it's the Lord. Yeah. But he was, his full glory, he wasn't in his full glory at that time. When they saw it, it was, it was accommodating to them. So people that imagine that when Jesus comes, he goes sit on a throne in Jerusalem, you can fly over there on a jet and see him shake his hand. See, these people are just, this is just a display of stupidity. I'm sorry, there's no dignified way to say it. But it's, a, it's serious stupidity. Nobody can afford, believe me, 
Nobody can afford to be ignorant or stupid. And I know those are harsh words uh -huh. about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. About us, we understand. You, you can have a stupid view of me and that, because there's enough about me probably to justify it. But not in Jesus. Not at all. And I so said, what about Stephen? He was, don't miss this, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up and he saw the glory of God. He saw evidence. Uh -huh. Not the fullness of it, yeah. but he saw the evidence of God and Jesus standing at his right hand. Uh -huh. Amen. He says the only other record of Jesus standing is where John saw him on the Isle of Patmos. Most of the time he's, he's seated. But it's like he rose up yes. <laughs> in honor of Stephen. Yeah. Rose up. Yeah. I'm in charge of this situation, oh yeah. servant Stephen. Yes. Welcome home. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But it wasn't the full glory. This, my point is it wasn't the full glory. And when Jesus manifested himself to John, he spoke. Oh, it was like thunder, like cataracts, waterfalls falling down. And he got his attention, and John said, I turned to see the voice. Yeah. That's an interesting yeah. statement, isn't it? Yeah. I turned to see the voice. Yeah. And here's what he saw. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt with a patch with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs are white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as they burned in the furnace, and his voice is a sound in many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun that shineth in its strength. Amen. Now, <laughs> did you notice those temporal associations? He was like something that John was familiar with. He said he's... Wool, snow, uh -huh. flame of fire, brass, furnace, water, stars, swords, sun. Well, that, none of that's going to exist that's right. when the earth passes away. This was Jesus accommodating yeah. himself to the frailty of the flesh. Amen. But even at that, it was so bright and so enrapturing. It so captured John's wish, he couldn't think anything else. Amen. Now, I, I will tell you that. If you can see a lot of Christ, it will resolve a lot of thinking that you yeah. shouldn't do. That's the power that Christ has Amen. upon a person. Amen. When you become absorbed with Christ, there's just a lot of trivial thinking and sometimes downright unlawful thinking just kind of yes. <laughs> is swallowed up, Amen. so to speak. <laughs> and my point again is that Jesus and his appearances before they were, they were subdued appearances. They were attention-getting and frightening, and, but they were subdued appearances. But when Jesus comes again, it's not going to be a subdued appearance. He's not going to accommodate himself to flesh because there isn't going to be any flesh. The dead's going to be raised and death will be destroyed. Now, there's a reason for this. The psalmist, he gives us a little kind of a keyhole view of the glory of God. He's Psalm 97.3. He says, A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round yeah, about. Uh -huh. So this is this fire, it's like his glory. Yeah, uh -huh. So whoever God is, where he moves, his glory just consumes. <laughs> consumes everything unlike him, just consumes it. That's why no man can see me in in, live, in the flesh and live. That's why. Because God, God's mobile, see? He moves about. He dis, Wherever he comes, he destroys what's adversarial. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Now, if it's true that God dwells in you and you dwell in God, if that's true, there's a lot of destruction. That's going on. There's things that are disappearing in your life. If the God's really there, because uh -huh. this a fire goes out before him, see. This is why any post-resurrection appearances of Christ were always subdued because 
this fire consumes. Nothing wicked can get close to the glorified Christ. Consumes it. Now, there was a very uh, abbreviated display of divine glory at Mount Sinai. It was a very kind of a small thumbnail picture versus a panoramic picture, just a thumbnail picture, very abbreviated, and it just like to destroy the Sinaitic Peninsula. The Sinaitic Peninsula lit up with glory. You could see it from afar off. The whole earth shook and quaked. It's just a little bit foot glory, you might call it. Just a little bit of foot glory. Just touched the bow. Just things just about fell apart. That's, that's a commentary on the effect. The effect of divine glory upon anything that's temporal. It has an effect. I know I've I've heard of, heard people who knew a little bit about glory, and they, but they talk about it in too common of a way. Glory came came down and what's that, and glory filled my heart. What is that song John Peterson wrote? Yeah. Glory filled my soul. There's an element of truth to it, but it's it's, it's a limited <laughs> limited picture because of the greatness of God. Here's some of the scriptures that talked about Sinai. That was a very abbreviated appearance of the Lord. The earth, Psalm 68, 8, the earth shook. The heavens dropped. What a word. The heavens dropped. Heavens dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. See, the whole mountain moved. Isaiah 64, 3. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, Thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. It's <laughs> a bad. <laughs> we, weren't wonder, we weren't nature worshipers when the glory of God came down, let me tell you that. Amen. The mountains are some of the most solid things in the earth. They, 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 they came like water. God came down. Habakkuk, he said something about this. It's, this thing of Sinai is, is woven throughout Scripture. If you've got a mind to find it, it's always startling what it says about it. Here's what Habakkuk said, Habakkuk 3, 5, 3, 3 through 5. God came from Teman. That is, the glory could be seen way back to Teman, which is miles away. But the glory could be seen way back there and up close. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah, think on that. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. Thousands of saints came with him, you know, angels. And his brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there, and there, was, a hiding, there was the hiding of his power. There, there was the hiding of his power? With all that going on, his power was hidden? That's what he says. Before him went a pestilence, and burning coals went forth from his feet. That was what that was God's glory being made known in a very abbreviated manner. But when Jesus comes, it's not going to be abbreviated. He's going to come in all. Scripture says he's going to come in all of his glory. Now, during Christ's earthly ministry, and glory has to do with who he is now, who he really is. He's not like a big brother, you know, it's a, or a close friend. He, he, he is all these things in redemption, but this is, his person transcends any of those comparisons. For Christ to walk with you not only requires you to be humble, it requires Jesus to humble himself to walk with you. But that's how great salvation is. It enables him to do this and be right in doing it. <coughs> but with Jesus in his earthly ministry, he wasn't glorified yet. You remember one day at the day of the great feast, Jesus stood on the steps and he called this out. He said, if any man thirst... Let him come to me. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, 
Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, how must that have sounded at that feast? Yeah, that voice are ringing out. Then John, he makes an editorial remark by the Holy Ghost. He says, now, uh, this he spake of the Spirit. This river is the living one. This he spake of the Spirit that they which believe on him should receive. I don't want any part of a non-flowing religion. I, go, I want to go on record right now. I want, I want a river flowing salvation. I don't, like, a river flowing. Out. Out. He, he spake of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> but he is now. Amen. He's glorified now. Now, when Jesus, before he was glorified, he spoke to his disciples, and John makes this comment, John 12, 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified. Yeah. Then remembered they these things that were written of him, and they had done these things on, that they had done these things to him. After it's like when Jesus was glorified, it opened the doors for the great flood of things that come with salvation, for the exceeding abundance and fullness and all things that pertain to life and godliness, and all spiritual blessings were unleashed. When Jesus was glorified. Amen. So those are things going to be glorified on earth. What are you going to do with this? How come we've received so much if the time of his exaltation hasn't come yet? This is a reproach to uh, Jesus. Peter said in Acts 3.13, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. That's why all this stuff is happening. Amen. Yeah. And when Jesus returned back to heaven, having accomplished the redemption, having provided a legal, by God's definition, legal basis by which God could make men righteous without forfeiting his own righteousness. Whew, what, a th what a thought, huh? He was a just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus when he was glorified, that's what opened the door. Somebody had to be with God that had no fault, no blemish, nothing that God could deposit it in Christ and Christ could deposit it in you. That happened when Jesus was glorified. And Hebrews 5.5 5 says, Christ glorified not himself, to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, that he's the one that made him, that glorified him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And that verse is about God, Christ's resurrection, not his birth. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He glorified not himself. God did. God glorified him. Amen. Now this has to do with Christ's exaltation. His glorification has to do with his exaltation. Acts 2.33 says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. All of a sudden, Peter and the rest of the disciples saw things they didn't see before. That's right. Amen. After he was glorified, it, it came to them what he was, what he was talking about. You probably experienced this. Again, he said, Acts 5.31, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, <coughs> for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus has so much glory, he can give repentance. Yeah, amen. Oh, you got somebody you've been praying for, you know. Keep this in the back of your mind. Jesus had been glorified. And he can give repentance yep. to Israel. That's the ones that crucified him. Uh -huh. yep. Those are the ones that crucified him. He can give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sin. 
and the forgiveness of sin. He can give it and the forgiveness of sin. So I don't I don't know if any of your past sins are plaguing you. I know there was a time when some of mine did, and there's still occasionally when some crop up. When you get older, you start remembering stuff that you're plum ashamed of. I'm talking about myself now. Down in your foolishness, say, my goodness. Jesus has been glorified, and he can give forgiveness. Amen. Well, it's a good announcement. It's a good announcement to make to people. He can give forgiveness. It may plague you now, but he can give forgiveness. He's been exalted. Philippians 2 9 says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. See, this has to do with him being glorified. Is this? Because to bring the church or to bring many sons to glory, it can't be done from earth. It's got to be done from heaven. It can't be done by a man or a group of men. It has to be done by somebody that's glorified, that's sitting at the right hand of God. It has to be done from heaven. And he's been exalted to bring many sons to glory. We could add in there safely to, safely to glory. But the fact is he has been glorified. And this has... Uh, has a lot to do with his high priesthood, which you don't hear much about these days. In fact, I don't hear anything about it. I prepared, you know, some years ago a series of videos, five different series of videos, Good News recorded them, about things that I felt most Christians were ignorant about. Not willingly, just the way it was. And one was looking back on your baptism mm -hmm. that I feel that most Christians don't really know what happened when they were baptized. But hey, so a lot of stuff happened yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you were baptized. And another was the uh, uniqueness of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Another was the high priesthood of Jesus. Yeah. And another was inner conflict uh -huh. and its remedy. Yeah. And the last one was the second coming of Christ. But this high priesthood of Christ, that's what he's doing now. Yeah. Uh -huh. But he's a different kind of high priest. He's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king priest. Right? He was a king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek was a different kind of high priest. Uh -huh, yeah. David was a king, but he wasn't a priest. Aaron was a priest, but he wasn't a king. So you couldn't, you couldn't mix those two. Uh -huh, yeah. Melchizedek predated the law, and he was a type of Christ, a king, a ruling priest. Yeah. Jesus is a ruling high priest. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's not ruling now to subdue the wicked, because yeah. that's no... This is, this is no problem with Jesus subdue the wicked. He could do that in the body. When he was concealed, he did that. He destroyed the devil by his death. He has no trouble subduing Satan and his host. He just breathes on him, and that's it. But he's been exalted to get the sons because they got to go through a war zone all the way. you got to go to heaven through the war zone which is Satan's territory, territory that God's given to him. He's the prince of the world by divine designation. you got to go through his territory. It's impossible if you don't have a ruling priest. But Christ's exaltation or glorification has to do with his high priesthood. says of him in Hebrews 6.20, Would that the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, king priest. says of him in his high priesthood now, 
which is his glorified state. His high priesthood is his glorified state. Hebrews 7.26, such a high priest became us, or just the kind of high priesthood we needed, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. You got to have somebody like that to get you home. You can't get home by a procedure. Special book, how to go to heaven. Oh, you got to have this rule and high priest. And you do have him. Hebrews 8, 1. Now the things as we have spoken, this is the sum. Let me sum up what we've been talking about. We have such a high priest who sat on the right hand of, God, of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. <laughs> we got that kind of high priest. And what's it say about his high priesthood? Hebrews 10, 21. And having a high priest over, over the house of God. Oh. That's his a glorified, in a glorified state, which is nothing about him is hidden anymore to those who can see him, which at the present time are only those in the glory. He is over the house of God. He's not been appointed head over the government. He's already there. He's the king of kings yeah. and of presidents yeah. as well and yeah. vice presidents yeah. and senators and representatives too. Yeah. He's their head. See, somebody needs to tell this. Yeah. Yeah. There is a man who has told him this. I heard him tell him. Brother Billy Graham did. Yeah, right. yeah. They gave him this medal of honor and he said he couldn't, uh, he couldn't leave without testifying yeah. of Christ and he told him yes. <laughs> who the boss was. Uh -huh. Haven't I? Showing you that the glorified Christ has to do with his exalted state, which has to do with his high priesthood. That we had to have somebody like this to get there safely. Yeah, amen. So when it says, not of works, lest any man should boast, that is exactly what it means. And if he's for you, who can, who can be against you? Amen. You stick close to Christ. Like sheep do, yeah. he'll, he'll, he's not going to grab you by the nap of the neck and drag you there. He's going to lead you there. Yeah. He's going to lead you there. See, a king can lead you. No shortcuts, but safe cuts. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Now let's look at these affirmations briefly. But he's coming in glory. He's he's already has the glory now, but it's it, he's in heaven. I, rem I think of the word Solomon said, God's in heaven and you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. <laughs> when Jesus comes in glory, he will be, what he is right now will be revealed. Yeah. Now here's, first, first Paul said this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. First to Christ, who in his own, who in, in his times, God's times, he shall show who is who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what Jesus is. Not what he shall be, what he is. He's going to show him who only, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to him be honor and glory everlasting. Amen. God at his, in his designated time He's going to pull back the curtain. Yeah, right. And when he does, everything temporal is going to be burned up yeah, amen. in the instant. It's all going to pass away. Uh -huh. Everything inimical against God is going to just disappear. Dis dis that's going to be it. Yes, yeah, and everybody's going to stand naked, yes, uh -huh. so to speak. Yeah. No masks. There'll be no masks mm -hmm. before God. But make sure of this. What's seen then exists now. Yes. See? But he's going to show it. He can't show it without doing away with the temporal. And once he pulls back the curtains, that's it on the temporal. It's yeah. gone. <clears throat> now Jesus is going to come in glory. Let's just, I just want to t touch on some of these, some of these texts because it's, it's mentioned quite, uh, quite frequently. Matthew 16, 27 
For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. How's that? And his angels. The glory of all the holy angels. Why, one angel can shake things up on earth. Just one angel showing up. All the holy angels are going to come. Matthew 24, 30 says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's a too late moment for everybody that's not in Christ. It's a happy day. For everybody to say, and say I'm showing you, he's going to come in glory. Not some glory. He saw some glory at the Mount of Transfiguration. Saw some glory when he turned the water into wine. Saw some glory in his various miracles. But he's going to come in, not some glory, all of his glory. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels, and all the holy angels with him, and they're an innumerable company of angels. Yeah. And men can really count high. Yeah. They're innumerable. You can't count how many. They're all, they're all going to come. That's right. In their glory, too. See, angels have glory. You, if you're familiar with Scripture, there are times angels would appear and they have a glory. And it, right. it would frighten whoever saw it. To think of all of the angels. Yeah. The shepherds saw a multitude of heavenly hosts. They heard them. <laughs> Sing it. Mark 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father yes, amen. with the holy angels. Now some people, I, they haven't thought about this, but they got to think about it. You don't want Jesus to be ashamed of you when he comes. Amen. That's right. Whatever you do, have to do to ensure that doesn't happen. And God's provided a means in his great salvation to avoid that type of shame. Because nobody is going to recover from that kind of shame. Mark 13, 26. Then shall I see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. See, yeah. In other words, when he comes, there's going to be no other power and no other glory. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. The kings of the earth, they, they won't have any power and glory. Uh -huh. Luke 9, 26. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my, wor and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's. And of the holy angels. And that's just about all the glory there is. Yeah, right. All of his glory, all of God's glory, all the holy angels' glory. Now, does anyone really think that can be hidden? That it could be secret? Colossians uh, 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So when Jesus is seen for who he really is, you will also be seen for what you really are. Yes, amen. That's right. John says we will be like him for. Uh -huh. In other words, it's a, this glory will be a transforming glory right. for those who are in Christ Jesus. They'll be changed in a moment, mm -hmm. in a twinkling of an eye. Be changed. Farewell, flesh. Amen. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4.13, Rejoice! Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. See? He's got it now. He's got the glory now. When it's revealed, you may be glad. <laughs> also with exceeding joy. Talk about shouting. Well, I'll tell you, when we see Jesus, there'll be a lot of shouting and gladness. Everything we've said about salvation, by we've, I mean we that are in Christ, Everything insightful people have said about salvation is exactly what we said. It's as great as we said. It's as powerful as we said. It's as transforming as we said. It is 
when Jesus comes. Yeah. That will all be justified. <clears throat> now, it's of necessity... You know, uh, if the glory that appeared at, at the transfiguration faded, and it did pretty soon, he, he was Jesus wasn't glowing when he come down the mountain. You know of a surety that the glory he comes with when he comes the second time will not fade. It will not fade. Why? Because he's going to come in all. The other was just abbreviated, just some. Quick them at all, his glory. <clears throat> now, divine glory, you see, is not suited for this world. Yes, or anything as temporal. That's why now we just taste of it. Yes. We have a taste, that's all, not the fullness. Jesus appearing in all of his glory with, with every eye seeing him postulates the end of the world. And the resurrection of the dead. How else are every eye going to see him? Yeah, that's right. See, everything as temporal will be gone yes. uh -huh. by this fire that goes goes before him, burns it up. In fact, it's Jesus' face, his glory, like is centered in his face, not in his feet, his face. Uh -huh. It's his face, the glory of his face, that will make the heaven and earth flee away. That's what Revelation 20, verse 11 says. From before whose face the heaven and the earth fled away and no place is found for him. See, when Jesus' glory is seen, like his face, not his clothes, his face, then what is the earth, heavens and earth, just, we've served our purpose, we're out of here, we'll be gone. Be no for, there'll be no further purpose for the earth as it is now. Yeah, there'll be a new heavens. We, well, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth yeah. where in dwells righteousness. Yes. And, the, and the thing that's going to usher that in uh -huh. is the coming of Christ Amen. in all of his glory. See, actually now, it's nature in this world that obscures who Christ is. Yeah. I know there, they mean well, I guess, and there's some things of Christ to be seen in nature. I know that very well. But it's very limited. What nature can show you is very limited. His power and glory. Now I can show you power in deity, power in Godhead. It can show that to you. But if you want to see the type of person Jesus is in order to salvation, it's above nature. You can't see it in nature. If the nature fails. It just can't shine bright enough. So we thank the Lord for it. It's like a thumbprint. It's like the thumbprint of God is on nature. And those who deny it just show you how ignorant they really are and how unwilling they really are and how hard their hearts really are. His thumbprints. Everything God makes has his mark, including you. So I'll leave you with those thoughts about Christ coming in all of his glory. All of it, all of who he is. He's not, nothing, no part of his person is going to be concealed. He'll just burst. All of a sudden, there it is. It'll transform those that are living by faith. That'll be, I don't know if it'll be your final change, but it, it's going to be the initial change that happens. Before, before, to enter in there, you've got to get out of here and get out of the body. And that's all connected Amen. with Jesus coming. Well, that's marvelous uh, to think about. It. My apologies for kind of not doing as well in this as I wanted to. But I'm finding more and more that uh, it requires uh, extraordinary discipline of thought and of intention to preach Christ. I could I could see it clearer than I did when I was younger, and it's just kind of like it's like I'm on the border, you know. 
just beginning to kind of see the things clearly. That Jesus is, he really is that great. Amen. That great. And I've talked to some seasoned saints that have walked in the presence of God for 50, 60, 70 years, and they, they testify to the same thing. They tell you that we just feel like we're just kind of in the, in the elementary course yet. They all say, say the same thing. That is a comment on glory, how great Christ's glory is. That such this limited amount of glory we've received, look what it's done, brethren. Look what it has done. He's given you a new heart and a new mind, a new song. Look what it's done. And think what it's got, fullness of the glory. Just imagine what that's going to do. Yeah. Brother Gene will have our...